Well, Sheridan Hills, here we are one more time on Wednesday evening considering the attributes of God in everyday life. We've been doing this for the past several weeks, and uh, we have come to our last installment of this series. We, we hope that this series has encouraged you and helped you know God a little bit more. We have considered the attributes of God, which are the characteristics of God, right? Um, we, we think of them as small pieces in a big mosaic. As we have worked through different attributes throughout the week, uh, we have begun to paint a big picture of who God is. We have, as a way of review, we have thought of the attributes of God in two ways. The incommunicable attributes of God. Those are some of the earlier attributes that we did. Those are the attributes that God does not share with us. These attributes exalt the greatness of God. So, for example, God is eternal. We're not. God knows all things. We don't. God is able to do anything. We are not. But we're also considered the communicable attributes of God. We've, we've looked at these later on in the series. And, and the communicable attributes of God are those that he does share with us. Uh, we think of these attributes as the goodness of God. So God is love and he calls us to love. God is kind and he calls us to be kind. God is merciful and he calls us to show mercy. Today, we'll consider the grace of God. But what is the grace of God? The grace of God is God's goodness applied towards us. Why do we need the grace of God? We need the grace of God because of our sin. Now, if you're paying attention, you may have noticed that this is the same definition that I gave to mercy two weeks ago. Uh, perhaps are thinking, wait a second. Uh, mercy and grace are not the same thing. And you're right. They are not the same thing. But, but they work together uh, almost like they're two sides to the same coin. So we thought of mercy two weeks ago as uh, God withholding the punishment that we do deserve, right? We should be punished for our sins, but God withholds that punishment, right? Because of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. Grace, however, is God's, uh, God, God's benefits applied to us when we do not deserve them. So, so grace is when God gives us benefits that we do not deserve. The Old Testament tends to emphasize mercy. The New Testament tends to emphasize grace. So let us consider a little bit about the grace of God. The grace of God can be divided into two categories. Uh, we can think of the common grace that God displays and the saving grace that God displays. Common grace is experienced by all humans, right? When he reigns, he reigns on the good and on the wicked, Right uh, when uh, we see many times those that are those that are not believers prospering, right? We see that as common grace. Uh, saving grace is experienced by those who repent of their sins and place their trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. This grace is only experienced by the people of God. So today we're going to mainly focus on God's saving grace. It's a big part of what we sing at church, isn't it? Some of the songs that we sing here at Sheridan Hills are Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Or we sing Grace and Measure, Vast and Free, That Knew Me from Eternity, That Called Me Out Before My Birth to Bring You Glory on This Earth. Or what about this great chorus? Grace, Grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Such a big part of what we sing because God's grace is such a big part of our joy. These hymns remind us 
that we need grace because of our sin. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then verse 25, Paul doesn't take a breath. He goes on and says, And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it is true, it is true that all have sinned and fallen short of the, of the glory of God, but it is also true that by grace we can be justified. We, our, our standing before God can be seen as righteous. And how is that possible? Through the redemption, right? Through the sacrifice that we find in Christ Jesus. So let us consider a little bit of how grace intersects with Jesus. We find grace in Jesus. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, he says this, And the Word, that is Jesus, right? The, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Saving grace comes from Jesus. We see that we receive, in verse 16 here, we see that we receive grace from the fullness of Christ. The grace is poured out from Him. Theologian J.I. Packer, who passed away just a short while ago, once said, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. The reason why we can experience the grace of God, the saving grace of God, is because God spent His life on the cross to forgive us our sins and give us hope. Listen to how we can see that even before the coming of Christ in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says this, But He was pierced for our transgressions. Right? Our sin demanded His sacrifice. He was crushed for our iniquities. Same thing being said here. Now pay attention to this. And with his wounds, we are healed. Right? Christ's expense for our grace received. His wounds heal us. And upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace. You see that? The chastisement, the punishment was upon him and we've experienced peace. So the grace that we experience comes from Christ's sacrifice. We experience grace in God because of Christ. But notice also in verse 14 he says that Jesus was full of grace and he couples another word here and truth. Grace and truth go together. Jesus' grace comes to us through Jesus' truth. So what are some of the things that Jesus' truth, Jesus' word tells us? Well, Jesus' words, words tells us that grace gives us salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So salvation comes by grace. Jesus, through his sacrifice, accomplishes right, our salvation. And through his grace, we receive it. But we are still called to respond by faith, right? You, see, you hear that? For by grace you have been saved through faith. What are we called to do to receive the grace of God? We're called to have faith. This is a call for believers and unbelievers. Uh, if you are a believer in Christ... The call is for you to continue believing and you will continue experiencing the grace of God. If, friend, you're not a believer in Christ, 
you are not experiencing the saving grace of Christ. You will not experience eternity with God in bliss, in heaven. Instead, you will experience an eternity of punishment. Friend, our desire towards you is that today you will say, I will place my faith in Christ so that I may experience the grace of God. Of God. Grace comes through faith, the grace that Christ provides. Grace means salvation is free, right? It's a gift. It is the gift of God. Grace means that the glory belongs to God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. So that all glory may be to God. And the reality is this. If all this is true, grace should humble us. We, we, should, we should be aware that there is nothing we can do to, to receive the grace of God within ourselves. We can't, we can't accomplish it. We, we can't demand it. We can only receive it by faith because the work has been done by Christ alone. So grace promotes humility. But what about works? Grace and works, do they go together? Many verses in the Bible seem to indicate that grace and works don't go together. Don't go together. But is that true? Well, it's not true. Grace and works go together. We understand that grace alone saves. But once we are saved, apart from our works, grace empowers, enables us to work, to do things that actually please the Lord. If we continue one more verse in Ephesians, we see in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That is the purpose of us being created in Christ. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Titus 2 verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all peop- for all people. That is the saving grace of God. No works required. But now look at verse 12. Training, right? The saving grace is also the training grace. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright lives and, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God teaches us to live godly lives today so are you struggling with sin are you struggling with worldliness friends what we all need right because to a certain degree are all struggling with this is the grace of god so we overcome worldly passions by coming to god for grace so if that is true how do i grow in grace that's that's a great question to consider Well, we can think of the ordinary means of grace. What are the ordinary means of grace? Um, The ordinary means of grace are regular Sunday morning gatherings, right? When we sit under the preached word of God, when we gather with fellow believers to sing the word, to, to pray the word, to read the word, and we gather with fellow believers to see the word portrayed before us through the Lord's Supper and through baptism, God imparts grace through these means. The word of God is observed and the word of God strengthens our faith so our grace grows. So if you are looking to go, grow in grace, which should be the goal of every Christian, do not forsake the gathering of believers. Be at church when church is gathered. Sit under the preaching of the word of God. Hear the gospel proclaimed Sunday after Sunday. These are the ordinaries, ordinary means of grace, which are truly extraordinary means of grace. What about personal spiritual disciplines? This is so important, right? We'll grow in grace as we grow in our disciplines. Pick up your Bible and read. Find discipline in, in reading systematically through the Word of God. Pray, right? Spend time in your day praying to the Lord. Seek ways to serve in the life of the church. We often, we often grow because we seek to serve others. And fellowship. 
Here's another way that we can grow in grace. Ask God. There is a verse in James that says this, James 4, 6. But he, that is God, gives more grace. God loves to give grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The humble will come to God and ask for grace. And God will give grace. Finally, if we have experienced the grace of God, we should extend the grace of God to others. So the lives of Christians should be characterized by grace. People should know us as gracious people, forgiving, forbearing, patient. So those of us that have experienced the grace of God should be the greatest example of the greatest of God to others. So friends, we have considered the grace of God. I would like to now pray with you so that we may grow in the grace of God together. So let us pray together. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for how we have experienced it in Christ. And uh, Lord, thank you that uh, you're not, uh, you don't withhold your grace, but you give your grace freely. And you give more grace. So Lord, we're thankful because you are a generous God when it comes to your grace. Father, we pray that Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, we would experience your grace abundantly. And Father, we pray that this church would be a source of grace for the community around us. Lord, I pray for some that may be uh, listening to us today who have not experienced the saving grace of Christ. I pray that they would. I pray, Lord, that they would reach out, that they would come Sunday morning and they would say, I, I have heard of this grace. I want to receive it. And that we would be able to help them understand your grace and, and know how to respond to it uh, with faith. Lord, I pray that this series of, uh, of uh, devotionals would help us grow in our knowledge and understanding of who you are. That we would truly boast in the fact that we know and understand you who is a God who is merciful and gracious. We thank you and we praise you for who you are. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that this has been a blessing to you and we hope to see you soon at our church in one of our gatherings and we pray that the Lord will be with you.